father up above, looking down in tender love. Uh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. And then it follows ears. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Careful, little mouth, what you say. Uh, little hands, what you do. Little feet, where you go. And very powerful message. It's applicable to adults, too. And I was thinking of that. You've probably seen the little statue, the three monkeys, where they see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, and there's even a fourth one sometimes, do no evil. And I'm going to include that one this morning in the sermon. So this is good advice for the Christian. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, do no evil. So that's what we're going to be talking about this morning because it's in harmony with the teaching of God's Word. So first, let's talk about seeing no evil. Psalm 101.3 says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. If there was ever a time in history when this is applicable, it is today in our modern society. There are wicked things that we can set before our eyes everywhere we go. So we really have to use some discipline, some discretion, um, some wisdom uh, as we go about our daily business. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. That requires personal resolve. It requires determination. Psalm 119.37 says, Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things. Again, in our society, there's a lot of worthless things vying for our attention for us to look at. All I gotta do is pick up one of these, I didn't bring it up with me, but our smartphones, as soon as you turn the thing on, it's got all kinds of news items and whatnot that, or <clears throat> interesting or not so interesting stories for you to look at. <clears throat> So what kind of things today are worthless <clears throat> and wicked? Take your pick. It's almost in every form of media that is about us. TV, movies, magazines, videos. And it used to be you had to go, for some of these things, you used to have to go to the bad parts of town to view this type of stuff. Now, because of electronics and all that, you can view it in the privacy of your own home. So that's a real danger. And in our society, there seems to be a constant diet of violence, illicit sex, profanity, graphic violence, and profanity, which is all around us today. And these things are openly contrary to Christian values and the teaching of God's Word. So I have some, I'm just going to read some of these headlines. These are from various sources. But this one says, time for parents, advertisers to say enough already to trash TV. That's an article I cut out of the paper. Trash TV. This one says, don't wait for a new chip, you know, turn off the TV by yourself. Exercise some self-discipline and turn off the TV by yourself. That's good. This one says, according to a survey, TV getting more violent. Well, we could confirm that, couldn't we? This one is interesting talking about the extent of sexual situations on TV, partial nudity, crude language, voyeurism, sexual dialogue, vulgar, crude language. 97% of, of the 65,142 people surveyed in this survey say television is too vulgar. So that's true, we would say amen to that. This one says, fall season promises to make families blush. So that's another good one. Let's see, this one says, 
According to a poll, most think TV is immoral. And we would say, true. This article says, protect our ears uh, from our children. Vulgarity has become an end unto itself. I curse, therefore I am, is the mantra of the new age. <clears throat> this is interesting. This is uh, out of the beacon from the Bellevue Church of Christ. No R movies for these kids. Talks about uh, Goldie Hawn, who's married to Kurt Russell, I think, and also Mel Gibson. They have made 10 R-rated movies between them, <clears throat> but they do not let their kids see R-rated movies, even ones in which they star. Although we don't let the kids see any R-rated pictures, Goldie says, it's amazing the amount of calls they get from friends who say, let's go see this, let's go see that. And I say, that's an R-rated picture, isn't it? And she says, yes. And I say, just tell your friends you can't see that. So they went to see something else. And my kids are proud of that because they're setting boundaries, aren't they? Setting boundaries for their kids because they love their kids. Um, you've got to give them some parameters, she says. And I call them boundaries. So that is really quite amazing. Um, that's it for that. But that kind of makes the point of where our entertainment media is today. So we really have to exercise some judgment and sound discretion uh, in our daily living. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. Next, hear no evil. Proverbs 19.27 says, cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causes to err from the words of knowledge. Cease to hear the instruction that causes you to err from the words of knowledge. There's a lot of that out there. Proverbs 17, 4 says, an evildoer gives heed to false lips. A liar listens eagerly to a spiteful tongue. Ecclesiastes 7, 5. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the songs of fools. What would the songs of fools be? Well, the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of this world. Secular humanism, atheism, materialism, hedonism. Secular humanism says man is the measure of all things. Modern man has made himself God. There's no absolute right, there's no absolute wrong. Each person, according to them, clarifies his own values system. This is called values clarification. And also we're into situation ethics. <clears throat> the Humanist Manifesto states, no deity will save us because they don't believe in God. So no deity will save us we must save ourselves. It's all up to us, according to them. Secular humanism is the religion of man, modern man. So I have this quote. This is from a, a book entitled Book Burning uh, by Cal Thomas. I'm just going to read a little bit of this. This is a quote from John Dunphy from an issue of the humanist magazine. Now, humanist is not to be uh, misunderstood as humanitarianism. Humanism is, is secular. It's a secular religion. So this guy Dunphy writes, I am convinced that the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their role as the proselyters of a new faith a religion of humanity that recognizes and respects the spark of what theologians call divinity in every human being. So he's admitting that secular humanism is a religion. These teachers must embody the same selfless dedication as the most rabid fundamentalists, that's what he would consider you and me, the most rabid fundamentalist preachers, for they will be ministers of another sort utilizing a classroom instead of a pulpit to convey humanist values 
in whatever subject they teach, regardless of the educational level, preschool, daycare, or a large state university. You see what he's getting at. And you see the dangerous scope of this. These people are serious about what they're doing. The classroom must and will become an area of conflict between the old and the new, the rotting corpse of Christianity, together with all its adjacent evils and misery, and the new faith of humanism, resplendent in its promise of a world in which the never realized Christian idea of love thy neighbor will finally be achieved. So you can see where he's heading with that. And we have seen this come to fruition in our society. Our, our schools are in trouble. So very, very real, very, very real danger there. Romans 122 says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's where the secular humanist is coming from. There is no God, no one that we are obliged to, no one that we are to be held accountable. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's where they're at. That's where they're coming from. What's God's answer? Well, let's look at a few of these. Let's uh, turn to 1 Corinthians, if you would. Turn to 1 Corinthians. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 1. First Corinthians 1. Let's start down in verse 18. <clears throat> We're looking at God's answer to these godless people, the secular humanism. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish wisdom of this world for since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe the Jews request a sign the Greeks seek after wisdom but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block to the Greeks foolishness but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God <clears throat> is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brother, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty, and the base things, the lowly things, of the world, and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So that's God's answer. And then we see again over in chapter 3, chapter 3, go down to verse 18. <clears throat> chapter 3, verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. That's what this secular humanism is. It is foolishness. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. They're useless. Therefore, let no one boast in men. So that's God's answer to that. Be very careful. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Next, speak no evil. Psalm 34, 13 tells us, Keep your tongue from evil and your lips 
from speaking guile. Now, guile is lies, deceitful speech, falsehoods. So keep your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking lies, deceitful speech, falsehoods. Proverbs 4.24, put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Matthew 15, 18, those things, this is the Lord speaking, those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. And then James 3, uh, 6 tells us that an uncontrolled tongue defiles the whole body. Ephesians 4, 25 tells us to put away lying and speak the truth. Ephesians 4.29 tells us to let no corrupt communication proceed out of our mouth. Ephesians 4.31 says, let all evil speaking be put away from you. All evil speaking. James 4.11, do not speak evil of one another, brother. Don't speak evil of one another. Don't criticize. Don't uh, find fault. Don't slander with, with malice or evil intent. Titus chapter 3, verse 2, do not speak evil of anyone. Speak evil of no man. That's not where God wants us to be. So the seriousness of the matter is brought forth and brought home in Matthew chapter 12. So let's turn there. Matthew chapter 12. And we're going to go down to verse 35. Matthew 12, 35. Actually, I'll start in 34. Oh, I'm in the wrong. I'm going to go to 12. There we are. That looks better. So I'm going to do Matthew 12, 35. So Jesus speaking here, he says, A good man. Out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. This is pressing upon you and me the seriousness and severity of what we say. Even idle words, things we might not take all that seriously, seems that it matters to God. Things we might say even casually. We need to be very, very careful with what we say. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. Finally, the fourth point, do no evil. Psalm 34, 14 tells us, depart from evil and do good. That's a very clear distinction, isn't it? Depart from evil and do good. Proverbs 3, 7 says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. So if we respect God, if we revere and respect God, we are going to depart from evil or do our best to do so. Proverbs 4.27 tells us to remove your foot from evil. Proverbs 16.17 tells us the highway of the upright is to depart from evil. And then Proverbs 4, 14 and 15 says, Do not enter in the path of the wicked, do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it and pass on. Go on your way. Now, is that difficult to understand? It's pretty, pretty clear, isn't it? And the inspired author goes to great lengths to make sure we're, we get it. Do not enter the path of the wicked. Do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it. That's the idea, kind of the idea of repentance. And pass on. Don't 
mess with it. Very, very important. And this is going to require effort on our part, isn't it? Yeah. It's going to require a deliberate, intentional decision, a conscious decision. You depart from evil. Be careful, little feet, where you go. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, do no evil. Well, now that we know what not to do, how do we keep from doing these things? <clears throat> what is emphasized? Well, here's what we should do. We're going to look again into God's Word for that. <clears throat> First, see no evil. Psalm 119, which is the longest psalm and just full of wisdom. Psalm 119, verse 18. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Wondrous truths from your law. Psalm 119, verse 82. The psalmist says, My eyes fail from searching your word, saying, When will you comfort me? Why are his eyes failing? He's searching the word of God. That's a good practice to be involved in. Psalm 119, 123, my eyes fell from seeking your salvation and your righteous word. So the inspired psalmist is putting forth diligent effort, isn't he, in the word of God. <clears throat> Psalm 119, verse 148, my eyes are awake through the night watches that I may meditate on your Word. He's going without sleep in order to meditate on the Word of God. He lies awake. He, ma he makes the sacrifice of going without sleep in order to meditate, to seriously consider and deeply think about the Word of God and its teaching. So look into God's Word. Look into the perfect law of liberty, as James says in James chapter 1, verse 25. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Secondly, hear no evil. And we look at Psalm 119, verse 9, which asks the question, How can a young man cleanse his way? Great question. By taking heed according to your word. By listening to and obeying the word of God. That's how a young man can cleanse his way. Throughout his time on earth, Jesus often said, Hear and understand. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Very, very important. Be careful, little ears what you hear. Third, speak no evil. We'll look at Psalm 119.13. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. Psalm 119 verses 171 and 172. My lips shall utter praise for you teach me your statutes. My tongue shall speak of your word and all your commandments are righteousness. And Colossians 4.6 tells us let your speech be always with grace. In other words, let your speech be always be always be kind, uh, gracious, considerate, seasoned with salt. Let it be pleasant. Let it be courteous. Let your speech be always respectful. Very, very important. Be careful, little mouth, what you say, and then do no evil. Again, going to Psalm 119, verses 1 and 2. Blessed are the undefiled in the way, the blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart, not divided interest, but wholehearted allegiance, seeking the will of God. Very, very important. Psalm 119, verse 101. I have restrained my feet from every evil way. 
the psalmist says, that I may keep your word. There's discipline there, isn't there? Self-discipline. There's resolve there. Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Divine guidance and divine direction. The word of God is going to keep us on the, the straight and narrow. It's going to keep us, our lives, in harmony with the, with the will of God. It's important that we stay in the word. Very, very important. And then... Psalm 119, verse 133, the psalmist says, Direct my steps in your word, and let no iniquity have dominion over me. And let me say, may this be our most heartfelt and constant prayer. It's a good prayer. Direct my steps in your word, O Lord, and let no iniquity have dominion over me. Very, very powerful. If iniquity has had dominion over you, and it happens, because we're human, we still sin, we're still tempted, and if iniquity has gained dominion over you, if you need to repent of ongoing, unresolved sin in your life, this is your opportunity to do just that this morning. If you've never obeyed the gospel by repenting of your sins, Confessing Christ and being baptized for the remission of your sins, we pray that you will decide to do that this morning. If you have a need, if we can help you in any way, won't you please come forward and make your request known. We will stand and say.